You know, my, uh, my father said that the key to successful speaking is lowered expectations. So thank you for that introduction. I, I, I don't know if I'm going to do exactly what they said. I, I don't know that I'll be able to tell you what in 2020 will be the magic technology or what today you should invest your money in so that you can afford to retire in 2020. But what I'm going to do is try to share with you some of my perspective and what we're investing in. So as you heard, I've been a venture capitalist since 1997. That means as a profession, I go out and raise a pool of money. I then spend three or four years investing that money and two or three years praying that one of those companies doesn't suck. <laughs> I hope to take those companies public and return the money to my investors. I started off at Ernst & Young in their venture capital group. I spent five years leading the seed fund of uh, Spencer Trask, which is the venture capital fund that backed Edison. Uh, I spent the last five years helping out behind the scenes on Dragon's Den, and no, Kevin O'Leary isn't really that mean. Um, but basically, everything I've done is about opportunity evaluation. How do you know today what will be big tomorrow? And to do that, uh, I, I call it future hunting. How do you sit down and think about not what's going to be on sale at Christmas time, but what's going to be on sale in December 2020? And again, Take it with a grain of salt, it's just one person's idea. You know, I may have seen about 23,000 business pitches to date, but it doesn't mean I'm always right. Trust me, I've been married recently and I've proven that fact. <laughs> uh, the world today. So I think we all agree that, that the world is an ever-changing landscape and it really does seem to be going a lot faster. Things seem to be changing at a rapid speed. Uh, you look back to, to the Arab Spring in 2011, and you see countries that were dominated by fascist dictators being overthrown by kids in the street. You look at the uh, sunsetting of the American economy as a political power. Uh, you look at the empowerment of Africa and the bottom of the pyramid, as they call it, through mobile technology, skipping over all the landlines, skipping over all the hard wiring. And to me, that's the starting point. You have to think about where are we going to be as a people, as a population, as a country in 2020, because that will lead you to conclude what will we need when we're there. So for me, it all starts with, with demographics. And the, and the first part of this uh, keynote, I'll talk to you about three trends that I'm very focused on. And the second half, I'll tell you about six innovations that I think fit those trends and are gonna be very big in 2020. I am quite biased. I typically only invest in digital startups, typically software, mobile. Uh, I don't know a lot about hardware or biotechnology or clean energy, but who does really? The three trends that I want to focus on, of course, are uh, the fall of the United States, the rise of the BRIC nations, and the shift in demographics. Growing up and going to business school, it was always about the baby boomers. Well, now baby boomers have been replaced as the key part of the economy with these millennials these people born into an internet age, these people born after 1980, these people who think it's okay to post Facebook pictures of their drunken escapades. It's interesting, I read this morning in a, in a blog that one in 10 uh, students do not get their job they've applied for because of their social network profile. So 10% of the people who would have a job otherwise are out of work because they decided to like or post something they probably shouldn't have. So when we look at, at these trends and, and we look at what's behind them, I, I think you can agree with me that there's a lot of pressure on the United States. They're, they're engaged in a number of wars, uh, some metaphorical, some specific. Uh, they're declining on their production. They have out of control military costs. They don't seem to be able to get anything passed. Uh, I'm personally shocked that after Sandy Hook that they couldn't get a gun regulation passed. But it tells you something about where their country is going. I think that everything comes down to demographics. A colleague of mine at the University of Toronto, not the University for Toronto, that's Ryerson, but the University of Toronto, Dr. David Foote, who wrote Boom Bust Echo, he really says that this is the only facts you can rely on, other than death and taxes, is that this pyramid, which is called the population pyramid, it has the, the, the males and the females on different sides, and it starts with the young people on the bottom, and it goes to the old people. It pretty much looked like this all throughout the last century. It had a, a big bottom bit, lots of babies getting made, 
and a small top bit because people were dying before they reached 80. Right? So retiring at 65 makes sense if you're going to have a 10 to 15 year retirement. Retiring at 65 could be more costly if you're going to live to 120. So how will this all play out? And why I like what, what David does is because he says that the one thing you know is that the people in the bottom group will move up a level every year. So you can actually project with some certainty, taking into account immigration policies, taking into account no major societal change. So if we come up with a magic birth control pill, or if another outbreak of sexually transmitted diseases curbs the population growth, maybe it'll change, but typically not. So if you look at the United States in 1950, you see a very healthy pyramid, but then if you go forward to today, you see a much more spread out line as the boomers start to move towards the top. And if you keep going forward, to the sort of 2050 endpoint, you see a big problem. Because these people at the top, these people who are 80 and above, they're not paying taxes. They're pulling money out of the economy. But yet the bottom group isn't larger. So you have less people working to generate revenue for the government, which we call taxes, and more people who are dependent on those government funds. So you can see that the United States, like a lot of G8 nations, have this image. Just by sample, there's the United Kingdom in 2010 and the United Kingdom in 2050. Same issue. This is the opposite issue in Brazil, Russia, India, and China. This is also, according to David Foote, what's causing the Arab Spring. You have a large population under the age of 20 with nothing but free time because unemployment is so high. And what do kids do when they are tired of their government, or tired of their parents, or tired of everything? They scream for change. Okay? That's quite different than going to the voters box and electing a new government. So what about Canada? Well, I'll show you a pyramid that I think reflects Canada pretty well. And I asked David for it, so let's see if I can make it work. So that's the population period decade by decade, starting in the 1950s and then ending in 2050. I think you can see a lot of things from this chart about our population, but what you do see is it's becoming much more top heavy. So as opposed to we have lots of young people and then people die as we get older, it seems to be that people are living longer and there are less people coming into the front end of the equation. And I usually can show that by example. Um, how many people have more than one sibling? So I have two, three, four, okay? And how many people have more than two kids? So do you see the difference? When you were growing up, two plus was the norm. Now, two minus is the norm. So that small change is a huge impact on a population growth. So when you look at this pyramid, you have to say to yourself, well, what's life going to be like at that time? What's life going to be like with 10 or 15% additional people not working and taking up social services? What will that mean to our economy? Well, this is what it'll mean. Right? 2020, we will have a $20 billion less in taxes. In 2006, 51% of Canada's total population is working. In 2020, only 49%. That different 2% is $20 billion in the federal budget. There will be more health care spending. In 2006, 13% of Canadian citizens were 65 or older. By 2020, that number jumps up 5%. It costs an extra $16 billion. Finally, seniors will be taking out their money that they put into their RRSPs and other government programs. And in 2020, there'll be another $20, $12 billion needed. You add to that the fact that in 2008, safe mutual funds, safe retirement funds went to zero. People like my parents lost two thirds of their retirement pool and now have to go back to work at 70 instead of enjoying my brand new grandchild with their brand new grandchild, my brother's son. So what does all this mean? Well, it means we're going to be down a heck of a lot of money. We're down $38 billion. What does that lead to? That leads to a lot of unhappy beavers. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not unhappy beavers, unhappy beavers. A lot of unhappy Canadians who have to somehow make up for this $38 million, $38 billion. How will they do that? Tax us some more? Maybe if they're NDPs. Right? Spent in the Senate? Maybe if they're conservatives. <laughs> Smoke it? Maybe if they're liberals. I don't know. But there's a problem coming. 
And what does that problem mean? Well, in addition to the fact that kids today, I'm mean kids today, I mean millennials, those under 30, those born after 20, uh, sorry, 1980, they're very different, right? They're very, very different. I don't know if you have any kids in their teens or their 20s, but they have this sense of entitlement. When I went to law school, we had to earn our grades. I had to prove I deserved an A on a paper. But today they come to me and say, I'm starting with an A, what did I do wrong to get this B? How dare you take away marks? And maybe that's the result of us bubble wrapping our children or telling them, it's good that you tried. Or the good Canadian thing, I'm sorry, but we're only second. How will, it's funny if you let it be, just give it a second. How will these millennials affect us? Well, when you compare them versus the other generations, baby boomers, the Gen Xers, you see a huge gap in people who judge effort, not outcomes. I teach a fourth year class, and this it's only about outcomes. They have to create a startup, they have eight months, and they're supposed to be judged by how much revenue they generate. Imagine that, judging someone's business on revenue. But they want to judge it on effort. I didn't sell anything, but gosh, I tried. I don't know how that's going to help your business. Trying hard is good, succeeding is better. These millennials are new, and they take a different way to manage. By 2017, the millennial generation will have more buying power than any others, including the boomers. But they don't buy the same way. They use social recommendations. They read the Twitter to see who likes the product. They can go into a store and scan it and get five other quotes on the same price, on the same object, to see if that's what they should be buying today. It's a different world. But the boomers will still play a part. Some of you is a good idea. You know, today they're, uh, they're between 53 and 68. By 2020, they'll be 60 to 75. They'll begin their retirement. They'll do little work, hopefully. They will not be paying taxes, but they will be drawing on health care costs as well as retirement costs. But change is nothing but an opportunity in disguise. One of my students came up with this. They thought that the best business in 2020 was a gap for seniors. You know how you have gap for baby, a gap for kids, and gap for regular folks, I guess? Gap for seniors. We're all the pants start up here. We're all the pants start up here and move on from there. One of the changes that we've noticed is retirement is different. When I was a young lad and I saw my grandparents, they would get into a small apartment and then maybe from there they would go to assisted living. Today, people are retiring expecting condo life, hotel life. In fact, I was surprised to, to learn that the bottom left-hand corner here is a brand new constructed retirement community that floats. And its goal is to sail around the world with all these octogenarians. I hope they have a, no stairs. Um, but you're seeing these, these, these communities, these, these condos geared specifically for it. And you're seeing people want to have that higher level of service. So instead of retirement, they want to have a high-end hotel. All of this is just demographic changes. So if that's life in 2020, what about technology? So what I've done is I sat down and picked about five or six ideas that I thought you would be interested in knowing about. Then I need your help to make sure I don't bore you to death. So these are the innovations I'm watching. First and foremost, one we all should know about, 3D printing. When I see a show of hands, Who's heard of 3D printing? Fabulous. So we all know how it works, right? 3D printing, very simple. Let's see if we can make this work. So that's commercial, we'll let it play out. 3D printing. No, I'm going to turn that off. That's commercial. We don't need to see that. Also, push, skip back. So 3D printing is much like the dot matrix printing. We don't need the volume. 3D printing is much like the dot matrix printer of our old days. It goes back and forth over an X and Y plane, and it drops a, a, a dot of ink or a dot of resin or a dot of plastic or a dot of biopolymer, and then it moves up a level. So it builds it inch by inch. But it's amazing because it allows for crazy things to occur. Everyone knows that the Canadians were currently running, or were recently running the space station. On the space station, they no longer order parts when something breaks. They print them. 
Okay? And think about it. You could print a valve to stop the flow of, say, oxygen into space, as opposed to having to wait and rocket it up. You could print on demand what it is that they need. And this is a statue of Yoda in time lapse photography. Yoda, of course, the greatest Jedi warrior ever. Uh, personal friend of mine, I guess, a uh, fan favorite. And this is now possible. So it sounds interesting, right? Well, that's fun. You could print Yoda. But what does it lead to? Well, if you would believe it. Well, two weeks ago, on the internet, as everything is in today's, this happened. That will take all I'm Anthony, and a little while back we talked about the Feds Distributed, the group founded by University of Texas law student Cody Wilson, and their mission to build a 3D printable firearm that's safe for one shot and then distribute the plans free online. So we asked you whether you thought printing firearms and their plans should be regulated, and you guys responded really strongly, both for and against legislation. But here's the thing that was all academic. Now it is real, because this week Cody Wilson tested and fired the Liberator, the first 3D printed single shot firearm. There's their hook test, and there is Cody firing by hand, which is actually pretty gutsy of him because one of the test guns exploded while firing. Now, 15 to 16 parts of the pistol were printed with ABS plastic. The only other part is the firing pin, which is made up of a nail that you can pick up from a hardware store. Defense Distributed also added a chunk of steel inside the Liberator to comply with the Undetectable Firearms Act. Basically, they put it in there because the law says a gun has to set off metal detectors. So this gentleman is a law student, not even a graduate, not even an engineering technologist, a law student, uses 3D printers to create the first printable gun. So what's the point of having gun regulations to stop you from buying a gun if you can just go home and press print? Now he added in a piece of metal so it would be detectable, but you think everyone is so courteous? You think everyone's going to? This gun is printed in under an hour fires off-the-shelf bullets, which in a lot of states are available without a license, and takes a nail from home hardware to fire. A 10-cent nail. And you can carry it on any plane. Any metal detector won't catch it. It's all plastic. But that's not even what's truly disruptive. He's giving it away. He's giving away the, the plans. He's giving away the computer sketches, the AutoCAD driver. Just the same way that kids took MP3s of music and traded them back and forth, and it destroyed HMV and Sam the Record Man, and it changed the way people listen to music and share music. What happens when I don't have to buy a table from IKEA, but I can just print one? Or what happens when I go to Mars and I don't have to bring all the furniture with me? I can print it as I need. What happens to the rights? How much of this table is putting it together? How much of this table is designed? And how much of this table is materials? And what happens when your design gets shared? Well, don't wait too long, because it's already happening. Right? There are print craft websites like shapeways.com that allow you to trade in what is called, wait for it, visibilities. Visibilities is the nickname to the design part of 3D printing. And there are websites trading visibilities from guns to consoles to, to, to things that aren't that important. I want to know how do I keep my iPod headphones from tangling. I can go on here and for a few dollars buy the visibility, the right to use that pattern, and then they print it for me. And it arrives in the mail. Think about the impact on mass customization. What if I could just alter it a little bit and then I'd have it for two headphones, Jazz? What does this do to all the intellectual property we haven't protected? Like, how do we design the podium? What's a microphone? What happens to the people who no longer require those raw materials because they're using resins or other things that can be mass produced and shipped? What will the impact be in 2020? But that's not even the crazy part. Here's the crazy part. Anyone read this story? This young man was born with a birth defect, and it was supposed to kill him within the first six months of his life. Every day, his trachea closes randomly. They rush him to a hospital, he's turning blue. Well, they rush him to a hospital, 
And the doctor said, I'm sorry to inform you, you won't be taking your son home. You can either stay here and force the lines open, break the air open, or you can take him home and he will eventually die in his sleep when it closes. But one doctor didn't want to do that. One doctor said, I got a third option for you. What if I printed something that could fix the side of his throat to keep his trachea open? What if I printed it out of biopolymers that would eventually dissolve once his own muscles develop? And what if I did it today? And that's exactly what they did. They used lasers to measure the inside of the boy's throat, create a computer replica of it, and then they printed this little thing which you see on the far right, which went into the boy, and he's now playing and living, and his parents get to keep him at home as a child should be. That's less than a month ago this happened. Okay? What happens when, instead of disabilities, we use your genetic code and we print organs that match? Last week, they announced one of those organs, the first artificial ear made out of biopolymers in a 3D printer. Imagine that. They're scanning your ear and printing out a mirror version of it. That's just mind-blowing to me. So while I'm alarmed that all the Americans have even more guns, <laughs> I'm happy about the idea that maybe there's an opportunity here. So for me, what's the opportunity? We're investing in these visibility platforms. Just like Napster and iTunes distribute MP4s and MP3s, maybe Fizzabilities will be MP5s. And whoever has the largest library, Fizzabilities, could win. So an active investment strategy is to figure out where is 3D printing going and what industries will it disrupt. We all remember, as I hope we all remember Star Trek, right? What's Picard's favorite drink? They're all very hot, right? And where does it get made? In this replicator. Isn't that just a great, 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 great grandson or granddaughter of 3D printing? I mean, it looks way cooler, but isn't that where all of this could end? If you think of 3D printers like Edison's gramophone and the iPod in today's version, maybe 3D printers will one day end up being our replicator. Fascinating how this small little change in technology created at MIT in 1997 is going to change the world, one printer at a time. <coughs> the next one that I'm looking at is, is facial recognition. Um, and if you watch a lot of TV, you've probably seen Person of Interest, which is all about a, a computer, which is using all the cameras in New York City, and facial recognition, recognizing people and tracking. But it's much more than that. Facial recognition is a part of the movement to artificial intelligence because it allows the computer to conclude, based on certain points, 75 in this case, who this person is. But go further down. You know all those videos on YouTube of cats playing and all of these things that people want to monetize against them? But the problem is there's so many videos that Google, who owns YouTube, can't tell you what's in the video, so what do we put an ad against? Well, they're using facial recognition at Google to see that there's a Coke can in the video and then sell to Coca-Cola a Coke can ad. But that's not even where it's going. Do you remember this from our famous Tom Cruise and his movie Minority Report? He goes in the store, the store recognizes him, an agent pops up and says, hi, would you like to buy those chinos? This is, you know, and, and that today is already happening. Here's a company that is already using this tool every day. Can we put on the volume, please? Thanks for joining us again. You're welcome. Talk us through uh, this great software. Well, at this show, we are showing a whole bunch of our software, but right here, you'll see our face recognition in a crowd. 
customize ads for his character pop up. That future is now. This billboard sees you, scans your face, then pulls up an ad you'll like. Here's how this works. When you walk into the ad, a camera captures your image. The computer figures out if you're a man or a woman and your age. Meanwhile, an age and gender-specific ad rolls. This shows that I'm in my 30s and I like seasonal pasta. The computer then determines how interested you are, how long you stay. That data is then reported for the company. So, NEC engineer Junko Amagai says the facial recognition technology is accurate to within 10 years of your actual age. The next-gen system they're testing out is even more age-accurate. This is a new age of advertising, says Amagai. We can learn something we never knew from marketing. The new ads give real-time reactions to screen size, so marketing can be more targeted and more effective. NEC believes the use of this technology in advertising is just the next step. Young Long, CNN, Tokyo. A little freaky. Walking down the street, you see different ads than the person you're standing next to. Walking down the street and you wonder, why are they pitching me the new Star Trek movie? Well, they must know I'm of that age and demographic. It's actually worse than that, or better than that, depending on which side of the equation you're on. They tie into Facebook now. Facebook bought a company called Face.com and is using it to tag all of your photos and to use those photos to write up who you are and how old you are and what you like to buy and using this to see who else is in the photo. Maybe there's a puppy with you and we should advertise puppy food. Sounds innocuous until you realize what could come next. Right? Maybe that isn't your wife you're standing next to. Should I tell her or would you like to deposit $25? Right? That's when the lawyers start. That's where the lawyers start. Well, by 2020, lawyers will have another thing to do. But right now we're concerned, and I told you earlier that social profiles like Facebook and LinkedIn get scanned by employers. What happens when those scans become automatic and they're done by computers a million faces a minute throughout every camera? You can look around the hotel, I'm just looking now, and you'll find cameras everywhere. What happens when all of that moves to the cloud and they lay on top of that facial recognition? There are some easier uses for it. Right? A lot of digital rights management are having trouble with videos get leaked. Right? So the new Star Trek movies on BitTorrent or someone's sharing it over the internet. They don't have enough manpower or staff power to be able to figure out who's that, whose video it is, who's being infringed. But if they turned it over to a computer to do it automatically and send out the warnings, the lawsuit notices, how much faster could they be? And there's one thing American corporations like, it's litigation, right? Stopping you the old-fashioned way by suing you. All of this is going on today, and by 2020, it will be prevalent enough to be on your desktop. To be on your desktop. Imagine when you walk up to your desktop, instead of remembering your password, the computer just remembers you. And it says, good morning, Sean. It's a little freaky if your name isn't Sean, but it's pretty good if you're me. Okay, So it's going to be used, and it's being used now. This company, uh, Digital Recognition, a great name, uh, uses it to scan YouTube videos and sell ads against them. So they sell to Coca-Cola, they sell to Dell, they sell to Nike. So if a kid is riding a skateboard in a video and doing a cool trick, and he's wearing Nikes, then a Nike ad pops up for that pair of shoes. It's interesting. It'll be interesting to see how that affects sales. The next trend that I see is one that you're probably familiar with. Anyone heard of the Internet of Things? Oh, good. Finally, I get to teach something. Here is what the Internet of Things is about. The origins of the Internet date back to the 60s with the initial experiments about computer communication systems. From the very beginning, it was conceived as a global network to exchange information and digital contents without restrictions of time or distance. Over the last years, Internet has evolved at an exceptional speed. Currently, there are about 2 billion people connected to the network. 
With the advent and proliferation of mobile devices, the way how we access the internet has also changed. The number of electronic devices that can be connected to network services has increased dramatically. But internet connectivity is also possible beyond these devices. Every object around us may be connected, collecting, processing and the internet of things opens up a new world of infinite possibilities. Can you imagine using running shoes that are able to upload to a website the time, distance, speed and calories burned during the activity? And what about this information being stored on the internet to track your progress over time? Can you imagine wearing a t-shirt connected to the internet, mirroring changes in your social network or displaying alerts about your favorite topics? Can you imagine your son interacting remotely with children from other countries or cultures through an internet connected toy? Day after day, there are more objects and devices that use the internet, which contributes to the creation of a smarter planet. It is estimated by year 2020, there will be more than 50 billion objects connected to the internet, an average of six devices per human on Earth. Smart towers, social networks, social network, furniture, sensors, sensors, smart cities, cities toys, people. It always sounds better with a British accent. When does Skynet decide that we're uh, no longer necessary on this planet? My vocal colleague refers to Skynet, which if you're not a geek like me, you wouldn't know, but it is the computer from Terminator that one day wakes up and says, you know what, these humans we don't need anymore. Let's move on. Uh, 2045, sir. Thank you. <laughs> it's in my Blackberry. It says 2045, start to run for your life. The Internet of Things is easy to understand. In the 1940s and 50s and 60s, there were eight or nine massive computers hooked together from universities and military complexes. Last year, there were millions of people in this fake, it's two billion people connected to the internet through desktops. Then the last 10 years, the smartphones came. But in the next 10 years, 50 billion devices will be connected to the internet. So let's think about the stove that pre-warms the food before you arrive. Let's think of the car in the Ottawa garage that turns itself on to warm up. Let's think of the chip you put into your kid's backpack so you really know where they went after curfew. Okay? What else can you do? Those are the easy ones. Here are some of my favorites. All right. So this is a company we've invested in. It's called, so, full disclosure, it's called Sensor Suite. And what Sensor Suite does is it throws up throughout buildings low-cost, high-efficiency, wired cloud sensors. What does that mean in English? It sticks technology into every corner of the building that detects before things go wrong. So if it's flooding in the basement, something I had recently and cost me $75,000, it would tell me when the moisture is detected. It would call my cell phone and say, get home, your basement is flooding. If you own a building, it would tell you when the fire alarm goes off. If you own a building, it would tell you which lights go off. And by the way, this is a two-way communication protocol. The device talks to the internet, but the internet talks to the device. This is Nest. You can get it at the Apple store. Nest is an intelligent thermostat, and it uses the internet, web technology, and apps to allow you to more efficiently control the energy in your home. It makes recommendations. You're not home now, because you went on vacation. Perhaps we shouldn't be spending all this money heating the house. These are the things that are just around the corner and by 2020 will outnumber the people on the internet by 20 to 1. You can even get your own smart sensor. It's called Twine. Twine is a little device. It's available on the net today and it does 10 or 11 things and it hooks right into a power outlet. So if you have water in your basement, all you need is a $39.99 Twine. You add it and you save yourself all that trouble. This is the Internet of Things, and it's coming fast. But what value will it be to us? Anyone here from Toronto? Ooh, sorry about the leaves. Um, <laughs> anyone here not like traffic? <laughs> there we go. So if you're from Toronto, you don't have a choice. But this is WAZ, W-A-Z-E. 
and it's a fascinating piece of technology. You download the app to your iPhone, and that's it. And what it does is it calculates the speed and distance and direction that that phone is moving in real time. So if you're sitting on a bus, say TTC or OC Transpo, and you go from stop A to stop B in five minutes, but it should only take two minutes, then traffic must be bad. Now imagine 10,000 people are in traffic on the Don Valley Parkway, and they all have cell phones. I don't know anyone in a car without a cell phone. And they're all connecting to the towers. And by using trigonometry and telemetry, they can tell when the phone is moving. Waz works today in a number of American cities by giving real-time traffic, not based on cameras or guesses or historical flows, but real-time data. This is an example of a map uh, that is using Waz to show which roads are most congested. Red is most congested, yellow is, uh, is not congested, and blue is normal. But they can actually show where you are in the mess, but it isn't your phone that's helpful. It's the aggregate of all phones that are helpful. Now imagine you're wearing a Pebble watch, a smart watch, or if you're more an Apple guy, the iWatch, which will be out this Christmas. And it's a smart device. It can tell you your heart rate, your biometrics. I mentioned earlier that I had a son born five weeks ago. Nothing? No, 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 no parents are not included. I haven't slept since. But we were thinking about how we should monitor the baby in the baby's room. Well, my sister had a kid. They had these little walkie-talkies. and They were voice activated. So when the baby cried, our, 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 uh, our version went off, our handheld went off. That was so 1990. When she had her second kid, she switched to Wi-Fi cameras. So when the baby moves or there's sound, the camera goes on and it transmits the baby to a video channel on the internet. That way my grandparents, my parents, her, their grandparents, can watch the baby on the internet. I don't know how I'm gonna monetize that, but leave that to me. But that still doesn't work for me because that requires you to watch the camera all the time or listen to the audio. So what did we buy? There's a new technology released just this year, used in pediatric hospitals and intensive care units, that sits under the crib sheet. It's long and it's flat. The baby lies on top of it, and every five seconds it measures the breath and heart rate of the baby. If the baby doesn't breathe in a prescribed, normal fashion, then every alarm in the house goes off. My iPhone goes off, and we can run up the stairs. <coughs> Why is this important? Because what happens at 3 in the morning if I don't recognize or see the video or see that? Furthermore, I, I think we would all agree that while poopy diapers is a bad thing, SIDS is an awful thing. So I don't really mind if my son is stuck in his poopy diaper for an extra five minutes. I certainly mind not an ability to intervene if his heart should stop or his breathing should stop. The cost of the device? Less than the cost of the Wi-Fi camera setup. Cost less than the cost of the Wi-Fi. What happens when it's not just babies we're monitoring in 2020? What happens when it's everyone we're monitoring? Right? We all have that commercial we've seen, you know, I've fallen and I can't get up, and you gotta push the button. If you've fallen and you can't get up, you may not be able to push that button. Right? That requires an active motion. But, but shouldn't we take care of our parents and our grandparents with passive sensors so that when they fall, we know already, or the healthcare person knows, or the hospital knows, or the doctor knows? Shouldn't we be able to use this technology and the Internet of Things to connect them all? The blanket that we used is used in a hospital for sick kids in Boston in 20 different pediatric cribs. So the nurses have on their phones all the kids' heart rates. And when the doctor comes in once a day, he can see what went on in the nighttime. Real information, not just guesses and, and hypotheses. Talking about medicine, the next big thing that I think is going to happen is personalized medicine. So for many years, <coughs> doctors have been guessing what's wrong with us. We go into the doctor's office, they ask you the symptoms, and then they look at those symptoms compared to a checklist. It's not likely you have African flu because you weren't in Africa, so it's more likely this flu. But if they're still guessing. They're not actually taking something out of your body to tell you what's wrong with your body. Similarly, when they give you medicine, they're giving you the medicine that's been approved by the FDA that has the most chance of working on the most people. It has nothing to do with you. 
You may be in that small category where that won't help. So what if we could do something different? What if by 2020, we could do personalized medicine? So your cancer treatment was different than your cancer treatment, down to the drugs we gave people. How can we use genomics and our DNA to do that? Well, here's how. And this is Hannah. They both suffer from an autoimmune disorder. Max is a patient today, and his story is based on current medical practice. Hannah's story is our prediction of what will happen in the future when medicine has become personalised for this condition. Max's doctor correctly identifies this condition and prescribes the standard first-line therapy, corticosteroids. Max tolerates them poorly and experiences nausea and vomiting. Max goes back to the doctor, who decides to revise his dose. However, diseases with the same symptoms often have different genetic causes. Genetic tests allow doctors to identify the roots of the problem and tailor treatments to each patient. Further analysis of genetic markers can aid selection of a treatment with minimal side effects. Hannah's doctor prescribes a genetically tailored drug for her condition. The new medical technology allows the doctor to treat the patient, not just the disease. Max suffers a hypersensitivity reaction and is hospitalised. His doctor prescribes Imuran after struggling to find a milder therapy which Max can tolerate. This leaves Max prone to cancers. Hannah's treatment is successful and well tolerated. Her condition is managed effectively. Personalised medicine. I'll give you a real life example. When I was six years old, uh, they took me out of school and tested me for attention deficit disorder. And they decided that me and a whole bunch of other kids should be drugged up. So they gave us Ritalin and Dexedrine. Now, in my case, 30 years later, 35 years later, I still take the meds because I still have the symptoms and I still have the issues. But a lot of other kids have outgrown it. So what's recently been discovered? They discovered the genetic marker for ADD. They can now genetically test to see if you're just misbehaved, full of too much sugar and caffeine, or if you have a treatable disease. And guess what? Half of the kids drugged don't have anything. They overprescribed because there was no personalization. But that can't affect you, I and mean, that's a doctor thing. Not anymore. This is a company called 23andMe. It's owned by uh, the wife of one of the Google founders, and it sells you for a hundred bucks or so a genetic test. They send you a kit. You swab inside your mouth like law and order, you send them back the sample, and they give you a report on the probability of which genetic disorders you are most likely to have, as well as what you can do today to minimize your chance of some of these diseases. At what point are we crossing legal and ethical boundaries? Because we assume the wife of Google's founder is simply going to send me back that information, not my insurance company or my kid, so he's going to get out of the country before dad gets too old and has to hey, deal with Where, When do we cross that line? You know, I think that's a great question, and I think we should leave it to the question and answer period, which will be at the end. No, 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 I think it's a great question, but I'll just correct you. She doesn't actually say she's only going to share it with you. You sign no, a consent. That's the assumption yeah, that we not, no, but you sign a consent in the purchase order that that data can be anonymized, aggregated, and used by them in the medical community to find better cures. But how long until they decide, well, my insurance company would like that, right? Because then I can charge me more or not cover me or that. Data issues like this in privacy are one of the greatest concerns come 2020. And if I swab my son, so I bought this kit, and my wife is at home cutting his hair and swabbing his, his uh, gums, because I want to know. I'm concerned over the 18 years that are going to come up, will my son have my ADD? Will my son have extra issues? But go even farther. What if you test it in utero? In some places in the world, there are gender issues where boys or gals are more accepted. 
And what if you tell them that you have the opposite sex? Is that a reason to not continue with the pregnancy? Real These are real issues. These are real medical issues being debated. I'm not that sophisticated, that I, I'm not that sort of doctor, that I can uh, weigh in well on these ethics. I can just tell you how to make money off them, which is good in some cases, but not in all. But let's leave that discussion for now. 23 and me. The next one I want to, you know what? The, what I wanted to tell you about 23 and me, I guess I should show you first. The leader in this, in Canada, Sunnybrook Hospital, sorry, Cambridge. We were very pleased to announce uh, for the first time that uh, genetic testing done at CAMH is being made available for uh, physicians in uh, primary care. And today we've launched this genetic testing service in uh, the Thornhill Medical Center, where a group of family doctors have agreed to uh, participate in our research study, looking at uh, how genetics can help the doctor write a prescription uh, with more information about the, what might be the right drug and the right dose for this uh, particular patient. It's not really science fiction, it's leading edge science because it's happening right here, right now. And this taking of genetic material is just the beginning of a lot of stuff we're going to have happen in the future. And whereas right now you have a medical alert bracelet that says you're allergic to penicillin or that you're a diabetic, Soon you'll be showing up in the emergency department with a little microchip that says, these are the medicines I can take for certain conditions, these are the medicines that I shouldn't take for certain conditions, and it will allow people to be able to get personalized medicine much better. It's not sci-fi, it's happening right now. It gives me the confidence in knowing that I'm on the best medication for me. It's, uh, it's taking the guesswork out of, of what medication I should be on, and now there's a... Uh, I know that there's science behind uh, the choice of meds for me. I'm just uh, excited to be uh, part of it. It's, it's been good for me, and uh, I think it's going to be uh, good for everyone who participates. By having this genetic test, we will be able to right off the bat know which medicines will work for them and which ones won't. Basically an agree, yellow, red, go, cautious, stop type method. And we know that the green ones are the ones that will work best, so we can concentrate on that. This should help the patient avoid side effects, save the doctor frustration, save the patient a lot of suffering, and save health care costs because there's less drugs to try, less visits to the doctor. We're very, very proud and very happy to be part of this uh, study. I think that it's really wonderful that we could be making a difference in this personalized medicine, which I personally think is way. So my colleague there suggested that there's an issue about the data and the privacy. And they've shown you that there's a, an ability to get better medicine. But what about the parental choices? So should my parents, if they had that ability, turn off my ADD gene? Huh? You know, maybe as a kid that was a suffering, but now it's a superpower. Now it gives me my creativity. It allows me to think in a different way. There's a boy currently on the book circuit talking about his autism and how his autism has let him be a graduate student at age 11. Age 11, he's going to an Ivy League school studying quantum space and quantum technologies. Speaking of quantum technologies, it is the next on our list. Another great thing from Canada. We've all heard about computers, obviously. Most of us know that computers are binary in nature. They use zeros and ones. They're on or they're off to do calculations by putting them all in a row. But what if you had more than one state? Zero, one, two, three, five. That's what's behind quantum computing. They exist as the tiniest parts of all of us, everything on Earth, and all matter in the universe. Yet in some ways, they're more difficult to study than galaxies billions of light years away. Subatomic particles. They are the components that make up atoms, including protons, neutrons, and electrons, as well as other tiny units such as quarks, photons, and neutrinos. Exploring the way these particles interact, especially during collisions, can help us understand the inner workings of the universe even back to the Big Bang. 
To do these studies, scientists currently use giant particle accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland or the relativistic Heavy Ion Collider in New York. But the science doesn't come easily. While accelerators yield valuable results, their size limits where they can be built. They're expensive to operate, and it may require years of collisions to gather enough data to properly study the particle. What was needed was a virtual means of studying collisions to complement and support the accelerator data. The answer, as reported in the journal Science, was to create a special mathematical algorithm. Our algorithm simulates a collision between particles of very high energy on a computer. The algorithm can be run over and over again many times, collecting data very much like the data that would be obtained in an accelerator experiment. However, such complex calculations require tremendous computing power, even greater than that possible from the best supercomputers. So, the researchers designed their algorithm to run on a quantum computer, a device where the ones and zeros used by digital computers to select between two choices are replaced by subatomic quantum states. These quantum bits, or qubits as they're called, can simultaneously represent all possible solutions to a problem. Unfortunately, a practical quantum computer is at least a decade away. The good news is that when that day does arrive, the quantum computer will have a powerful tool on hand that it can put right to work. Well, that decade happened a lot quicker. A company out of Vancouver called D-Wave invented the first quantum computers and began selling them earlier this year. They sold them to NASA, to Google, and here is their vice president telling you what they could use it for. Because not all of us care about quantum space experience. Imagine being able to predict patterns in weather so that you could prepare for really dangerous storms or earthquakes or maybe droughts. Imagine being able to predict patterns in the stock market so that you could detect if, if something was going wrong, like if there was an impending market crash. Imagine discovering patterns in genetic data that could lead to the advancement of new treatments for cancer or different, different treatments for diseases. All these tasks at the moment require an immense amount of computing and processing power. And what we have is we have computers that are just really inefficient at doing this. And we just throw more and more resources at these problems. And we're still not managing to solve them very well. So what we're designing is a computing system that's much more efficient at solving these types of problems. It's really just a case of using the right tool for the job. And that right tool is available now. D-Wave, another great Canadian company. Just to put it in perspective, D-Wave's computer is about a thousand times faster on complex calculations than a regular computer that you would buy right out of IBM or Dell or, or, or at a corporate level. The last technology I want to talk to you a little bit about today, and as you can see, I've gone from ones that you know, 3D printers, which are kind of easy to focus on to crazy stuff like quantum computing. We're going to end with Google Glass. Anyone heard of Google Glass? Good. So some have, some haven't. This is what it does. Google put together a short video showing some of the features to expect. 
mainly it seems geared towards social networking and a few other apps like navigation and communication. Although it's the first step towards a truly augmented reality world. At the moment, it doesn't look like glasses will offer the true augmented reality experience that we were all hoping for. In the future, we may see glasses that have video screens that cover your entire field of view so that a true augmented reality experience can be achieved. My vision of AR glasses is one that uses 3D camera tracking and 3D computer models that are displayed on top of real objects. I envision walking into a grocery store wearing augmented reality glasses and seeing video advertisements displayed on product boxes. The product packaging will act as markers for the 3D camera tracking, and when the glasses recognize it, they'll display a video or a 3D computer model on top of the product. Greeting cards are another great example. Walmart already has a line of augmented reality greeting cards, but you need a computer and a webcam to view them. Imagine getting a greeting card from someone and looking at it through augmented reality glasses and seeing 3D models displayed on it or fireworks flying out and spun down at your birthday. AR glasses would also make being the mechanic much easier. Imagine looking at an engine and having the 3D specs displayed on top of it telling you what to fix and how to fix it. It will also make gaming much more interactive. Imagine two people wearing augmented reality glasses and playing a game together. Each one would be able to see and interact with the same video game characters as if they were in the real world. So they're talking about augmented reality. Augmented reality is when you put other information on top of what our eyes see. If you ever watch one of those, well, back to your Terminator video, when he looks through the Terminator's eyes and you can see them identifying this is a gun, this is a motorcycle, same idea. I cannot put together IKEA furniture. I have tried for years to learn it. But with Google Glass, I could put on my glasses and it would show me step by step how to put it together. My wife would have left me by that point because I'm wearing Google Glasses. Wow, tough audience. Um, there are a lot more uses if you take Google Glass to 2020. If you can think about it one step further. What happens when it's not geeky glasses, but contact lenses that people can't see you wearing? So when I walk up to you and I say, nice to meet you, I don't need to look at his name tag. His facial recognition software is triggering him, checking Facebook and telling me his name is See, I can't even see. His name is Ron. See how slow that was? How awkward that was? But if I put on my Google Glasses, hi Ron, nice to see you. Think about that. How about translations on the fly? What about going into foreign countries while you're on, on a vacation and, and seeing the prices in English? Right? I, I love travel. I had a lot of trouble when I went to Japan. Because all the street signs, of course, are in Japanese. And to me, ignorant as I am, I couldn't tell the difference between all the characters. But if I was wearing Google Glasses, I would see it in English. Again, some will probably beat me up and take them. But, but there are a lot of uses, and a lot of evil uses.
2020. If you want to know what it could be, I recommend the show H Plus. It was made by uh, JJ Abrams, and it's only on YouTube. And it basically talks about what our friend was talking about, what happens when we're all connected to the internet directly, and all that data is being processed. Because those glasses are tracking location, what he's seeing, what he's buying, and all of that's going into the cloud for whose use. And the H Plus, which I would suggest is the future of, uh, of glass, tells you a little bit about that. As for the fact that you can actually do it with contact lenses, I've been tracking since uh, 2009 a scientist in the United States who has built contact lenses that display uh, tech on them. And there's a picture of it from the, from the patent. So they're already working on moving the glasses to the contacts. How far before they put it right into your head? Did they chip you? And you can see it through your visual cortex instead of external. And if so, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That I can't comment on. But I can comment on the fact that it's going to be a huge change. So what does all this mean? The kids are coming. The rise of millennials. America is changing its position in the world. Uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China all adopting technologies faster than the rest of the G8 nations. The ones that I'm watching include 3D printers, facial recognition, the Internet of Things, personalized medicine, quantum computing, and Google Glass. There's a lot of video, but I think it tells us very much that anything is possible when it comes to emerging technologies. If you want to know more about what's coming down the pike, here are some books that I recommend. Wikinomics by Don Tapp. Scott talks about collaborative economy. Uh, that used to be us by Tom Friedman, talks about the uh, decline of the United States. Uh, the next hundred years in 2050, talk about technology moving from science fiction to science to everyday life. And then I Live in the Future by uh, Nick Gilden is one of my favorites. One of my favorites that I'd like to share with you, uh, courtesy of the Ted Rogers School of Management, if you're interested in knowing how opportunities get evaluated, why some people get burned to the den, and some people do well, if you want to know how a venture capitalist looks at 20,000 pitches and decides how to invest, well, I recommend my book that I'm a little biased, Hot or Not, How to Know If Your Business Will Fly or Fail, uh, the conference and Ted Rogers School of Management have bought you all a copy, so you are welcome to pick it up digitally by going to hotornotthebook.com slash profit and typing in the letters profit, P-R-O-F-I-T, and we'll download you a free copy of my book. If you have any questions, we're going to take them now. But I want to thank Oh, of course. Hotornotthebook.com slash profit.php. You'll be able to find it there. It's a free book. And the code word is profit, P-R-O-F-I-T. And some of you are ready to get down, which gives me great thought that I didn't completely waste your time this morning. I didn't bore you to death showing you videos from YouTube, but I want to thank you. And I want to hopefully leave you with a few thoughts that you'll be able to talk about throughout the day. We're going to open the floor up, but thank you very much. I'm Dr. Sean Watts.
I'll open up the floor to questions. Yes, sir. When we're talking about things like Google Glass and Google uh, Play, I'll repeat it, not to worry, I'll repeat it. Technical skills and that, what does that do really to the development of expertise in our country if we just the kind of people who decide how to do it? So the question was, what is the role, let me paraphrase, what is the role of experts if you're able to transfer the knowledge on demand? So if I don't need to take my car to the mechanic for an oil change, because I can wear Google Glass, and it will show me step by step. It's an interesting question. But I would suggest to you that that's been going on for decades, if not hundreds of years, right? The industries and the economy reflect the needs. And as those needs shift, we shift. So libraries were once the source of all knowledge. And now I don't know what we do with it. Right? Wikipedia is the number one source used by my students. What happens to experts? Well, I think experts continue to be needed for innovation. So in academia, we refer to two types of knowledge, tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge. How to change the oil in your car is explicit. These are the steps. If you do it nine out of 10 times, it's gonna work. But tacit, how to ride a bicycle, how to play a guitar, those still require experts to push the boundaries to grow. But I think you're very correct in that if I was one of those experts, I'd be wondering about if Google's going to take my job. My wife, beautiful as she is, was a travel agent. But I believe, and I was correct, that the travel agents would go out of business. Because 20 years ago, they were the only ones who had Sabre, who could log in and buy a ticket. But now, I can do that myself. So what do I need them for? Especially if I can cut out the pricing. So my wife became an expert at corporate travel where corporations don't want to do the direct buying, they want to outsource it. So if she stayed a travel agent, she'd be one of the 90% of the travel agents out of work. But she ended up shifting. And I think that's what I would ask you to take away from it. I think things like Google Glass will put an end to some of the more uh, basic things. I was joking earlier that uh, we were trying to hold up our, uh, our, our stroller. It's one of these strollers that one hand, you push it, it collapses. Well, 35 minutes later, I'm shaking the thing, and I can't make it collapse. My wife walks up and she goes, watch the YouTube video. And I stand there, I watch it, and 30 seconds later, it's in the car and we're on our way. So did I displace the expert at the baby store, or did I make my life more convenient? I think it's about creative destruction. Things today kill what came before. The MP3, the Napster, 10 years later has destroyed the Sam the Record Man, the corner store record store, because it's all digital now. Same thing, uh, about six years ago, I advised Blockbuster to buy Netflix. Because I thought stores and Blockbusters and getting your video will go the same way that, that, that CDs went. They didn't think it was a good idea. How could we ever be displaced? We have 600 stores named Blockbuster. Where are they now? Okay, I'm on Netflix, so is everyone else. Who's next? Rogers. Who's after that? I just gave a speech, I was almost killed as I tried to get off the stage, to a real estate brokerage, a national real estate firm, telling them that real estate agents are next. You can't displace car buying, travel agents, stockbrokers, all of whom depend on confidential information sources. And once those sources are open, anyone can do it. So once upon a time, if we wanted a house, we went to a real estate agent because they had MLS access. But now we have MLS access. And so real estate's getting very afraid that their cherry little job at 5% of the purchase price is going to get pushed out their righteousness. Creative economies create destruction that changes it and apparently makes it more efficient. Yes, ma'am. results matter, not just the effort. 
You know, I, I often say that it's quite an inappropriate statement, but if your grandmother is in surgery and the doctor comes up and says, we tried really hard, but she's dead, his effort of trying is quite irrelevant to him. She's dead. It doesn't matter whether he tried best or not. He's tall, he's short, he's happy, he's not. I like it, I don't care. His job is to save grandma. In my mind, basically. Right? And I don't care about his effort. So what are we going to do when doctors are like, well, I tried to cure you, but too bad. I got a medal for it at soccer. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what's very important when you talk about real estate agents or people whose work is threatened is value chain analysis. Where are you adding value? Where can you not be replaced by a computer? Where can you not be replaced by an automaton, a device that just repeats the same motion again and again and again? And I think those roles are really an innovation in seeing what's next. Because our minds are still, at least until the, the, uh, the computers take over, the most powerful computing engines on the planet. But according to a lot of theorists, by 2030, 2040, that won't be true anymore. And when computers can make that are smarter than the original, then we're going to have trouble. They call that the singularity, and that would be an entirely different presentation, and, uh, and a much scarier one. Dr. West, are you satisfied as a parent and as a potential grandparent, do I want an electronic circuit board under my grandchild when there's still a raging debate, I believe, over the efficacy and the impact of microwaves on the brain and cancer and all of that? Secondly, can you answer the question bad enough that young people have MP3s in their head, bad enough people walking across the road with their Blackberry 3D. We're going to kill most of the young generation if they have Google classes because they're going to be oblivious to traffic. It's just a general comment. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a question. <laughs> but, but I'll answer it anyway. How will the government regulate that? I say we don't. I say we let them get run over. <laughs>
but then it's too expensive to buy the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's too hard to carry it around with you. So you get Wikipedia. It's a change, and it's a part of economic evolution called creative destruction. Sam the Record Man and record stores should die and be replaced by what's more efficient. Governments should fall and be replaced by what's more efficient. The danger, of course, is, though, that more efficient isn't necessarily majority wins. You know, we have representation in the House of, of Commons because 200 years ago, we couldn't vote on every issue. So we need to send someone to represent our issues. They couldn't tell us what the vote was. But today, every matter in Parliament, you can push to your smartphone and you could vote. Now, would you make better or worse decisions than Mike Duffy? <laughs> <laughs> but it's coming. And how we deal with that is going to be fundamentally a change. Government by representation is now much more easy to empower. But what the long term effects of that? I'm not smart enough for that. Yes, sir. My question is, with Google Glass, are they doing anything to develop the outputs of that to be able to use with the optical nerve for people that are blind? So that's a fascinating question about Google Glass and can it be used for the optical nerve. I don't think Google Glass directly is, but what you're discussing is being worked on. So if you understand how, I'm not going to assume, uh, the cochlear ear, the, the cochlear and your implant right, bypasses the broken parts of your ear and goes directly into the parts of the brain that hears. I'm totally oversimplifying it, right? So what if you could do the same thing with eyes that don't work, by like putting in another sensor, so I had a camera here, and it went to the same part of my brain. That has just begun. They are doing FDA testing. Currently, all people can see is black or white, dark or light. But it's the same thing with the contact lenses. Currently, the contact lenses can only display one letter. But how long before the Atari 64 that we grew up to becomes the Apple PowerBook? Right? Imagine we could let people see by implanting cameras and tying right to the brain. So Google Glass, to my knowledge, is not directly working on that, but that is directly being worked on. And I know that if you Googled uh, Popular ear implant for the eye, just to simplify it, you would actually find the research that's out there, maybe 2020, 2030. But again, it'll go in increments. Blurry, black and white blurry, a little bit of color, HD. Right? <laughs> but, you know, I have terrible vision and I appreciate everything I can see. Imagine if you didn't have that opportunity. Or 3D. Or 3D. Well, we all live in 3D, so it's simple. Yes, sir. I want to come to some So we're talking, the gentleman was raising the point about how more and more we become ignorant of how the technology works, and we just get to know it works. So once upon a time, my father was in school, he would take car shop, and they would learn how an engine works. Now it's all chipped out, and you need to have a computer engineering degree to change your oil. How does that impact overall? I don't know. What I do know is, I think it was uh, one of the famous science fiction writers who said, that eventually all technology looks like magic if you go far enough along. So what we have now, the phones, look like Dick Tracy 50 years ago. A watch phone, come on, that was, a, that, was, that was right out of a movie. But we have them today. So what becomes science fiction becomes every day. So will one day we not realize how anything works? Perhaps, or perhaps we'll go back to where our friend said, that computers are actually creating smarter computers and they do the innovation. Because currently innovation is still us. Pushing two disparate ideas together causes a third new idea to come up. I don't know where it all ends, but I'm glad we were alive, alive long enough to see it. On oh, the firewall, sir, you missed your opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I don't think he mean to you because he was mean to you. Oh, he's always mean to me, though. Well, that's why I figured you're good for it. Go ahead.
ethical profit. Okay. No, no, I actually think about this. I do, right? Because I am Canadian. It isn't profit at all costs. So I like to see myself as having enlightened self-interest. Right? So me winning and the rest of the city of Toronto losing doesn't make it good for me because I don't have a city to lose. Um, I draw the line at any kind of profit that is made because of the disadvantage of others. So if I don't give you enough information to make a reasonable decision, that's not moral profit. That's me screwing you with the lack of information. So I believe if you fully disclose things, you can create a competitive product. If you sell it in an ethical, disclosure-based way, then you should be able to reap the benefits of your profit and return them not only to yourself, but to those who helped you make them. So in the companies we fund, we often have employee sharing plans, and, and we try to make sure the money doesn't just end up in one person's pocket. Because I think when you have 1% of the population extremely wealthy, and 99% of the population starving, no one is served well. There has to be a balance between societal needs and profit. I try to help my students understand it with this bastardized metaphor. Uh, I have the right to move my hand up until it interferes with the right for Ron, for Ron not to have his nose hit by my hand. So if I want to do this all day, that's on me. But if I want to do all this in a moving elevator filled to the brim, that's not cool. And it's the same thing I believe when it comes to moral capital. I'll follow up, it's too tough for me to deal with. Yes, you go ahead. <laughs> I 
think about this stuff every minute of the day, and so the chance to get to share it with you guys makes a narcissist like me truly happy. <laughs>